we are on our way into the future tomorrow. It's a shame, I have to tell you, that it uh, took till beginning of uh, 2024 that I got in touch with Catherine Mason by Caroline Churi. Thanks a lot to you, uh, Caroline. Um, thanks for connecting me. Um, Catherine is an independent art historian and, and well-known writer from UK. Um, she just published Creative Simulations, a, a Springer book about the early computer art society in UK. And she will give a presentation that is related to that book tomorrow, too. Today she is just moderating and you already see the... Um, you see Catherine and uh, is, is Joan also here? She is here also. We have, we have two uh, fantastic uh, artists today. W well, uh, Catherine, maybe you come to the, to the uh, panel already. And Joan Truckenbrot, I would ask too. She is a wonderful artist uh, who started, uh, who began with computer art also in the uh, 70s, very early. Um, and then we have a multimedia pioneer, Mechthild Schmidt-Feist, originally from Germany, but now uh, since quite a long time living in, in America and also um, uh, being a professor and education, educating young people in, in this uh, field. It's a wonderful group uh, of these three women and uh, that's already the program. Um, they will exchange their ideas about women in a man's world, and I'm really looking forward to it. It's a great honor for me to have you here at this panel. Great. Thank you very much, Suzanne. It's been um, wonderful to be here. And in this session, we're very fortunate to be speaking with two of the female pioneers of digital art. So we're going to take a look at their work, which in the early days of their careers was a field largely dominated by men. And not only that, but they were using a material and a method, digital computing, that wasn't well recognized by the art world at that time. So we're going to hear of their experiences navigating this art world and we're going to consider how they approach the technology and whether it might be different from a male perspective. So first of all, I'm going to ask each artist to give a little presentation of their work so we can see some art. So if you'd like to start, Joan, please. Thank you so much for inviting me, Suzanne, and I appreciate uh, all of the support from the Herbert Franca Foundation for my ability to participate in this in incredibly important forum. The first time that I unrolled a series of drawings from the plotter, the pen plotter, in around, oh, I would say 1973, 1974, I, it became the catalyst for a series of drawings through the next following years, and I programmed these drawings in Fortran, which I found to be a very expressive and fluid kind of language. I incorporated formulas from the sciences that described the visual dynamics created by natural phenomena in the world, like wind currents and how light waves reflected off of irregular surfaces. So that was embedded in these drawings, and I was interested in using variables to create a series of related but different kinds of um, drawings. And you can see that I explored an incredible range of these drawings. And the plotter that I was using was not able to work in color, and so I integrated color by using color xerography and transparencies. So this is a series of drawings, each of which was um, copied in a color transparency and then superimposed. And this is another one of those uh, drawings. And then, because I really lived between the digital realm and the physical realm, and materiality was always important to me, I found a way to begin to create uh, textiles using programs. So this was done in 1978, 79 um, with an Apple computer. So these boxes are the pixels that you see. And I programmed a series of the images, turned the monitor upside down on a copy machine, and copied each 
frame of that series on heat transfer material and then hand transferred them with an iron onto uh, polyester fabric. And this was the first one, and it's called electronic patchwork, both in terms of reference to the patch boards that we had and American quilt making. And so there are a series of these. I also began to experiment with changing the rectangular, rectilinear form of these pages that came off the copier. So I cut them up into a pattern and then rearranged them and also heat transferred them by hand onto fabric. So in my work, the hand is always important. And I went on with the opportunity uh, early 1980s to work with 3M scan -a mural plotter. This is a very large piece, 11 feet wide by seven feet high. And I'm working in this case with also the fluidity of natural elements, but also color fields and Joseph Albers' uh, interaction of color. This is a detail, and the reason I show this is um, the process, artifacts of the media are also important and valuable. And so the edges of these geometric forms had little white edges that made it look three-dimensional, although it was two-dimensional. And this is another one of, of these. This one will be in Luxembourg in an exhibition starting in September. And from there, I went on through a whole series of different media. And I'm currently using a hand digital uh, loom, the TC2 thread controller, and I'm creating a, a wide range of uh, hand woven textiles. The images are designed digitally using Photoshop. And there's a whole series one has to choose um, color areas and stitch patterns, and then that translates to the, to the digital loom. And the digital loom picks up the appropriate threads at every intersection point to create the color on the textile. I like to work um, not in a regular way, but in a more disruptive way, so that I integrate different ideas within one uh, textile. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joan. Okay, now we can hear from Mac Tilde. Good afternoon, and thank you most of all for inviting me. As I met Herbert in the mid 80s when I was working in Munich at ARI and doing uh, computer animation. So we're jumping ahead a decade or so. My background is in fine arts and I came from painting to installations to video to computer graphics. So I call it four decades in four minutes. I like the drama of it, even if it's just approximate, this one. So first of all, for my motivation. In those days, as an artist, you really had to justify why you would work with computers, why you abandoned the canvas for pixels. And I thought this was really an amazing time to get involved in computer animation because I thought this is going to be a medium that defines the late 20th century. I still love painting, but I thought this was an opportunity to do something new, and I thought artists shouldn't shy away from it, but they should be involved and help shape the medium, help shape to create a visual language in what was then quite raw and awkward in parts. Uh, these were some first tries. I, I put together main works, which were often performance pieces or collaborations with theater or dancers. But this was an early animation. It runs also outside in the hallway. And then a way to try to use pixels, pixelation, photographs, layer elements that sort of I kept doing for a long time. This is a very large production of full evening theater production. It was important to me to use an established theme and not say, oh, you know, this is just going to be games or something that has no relevance in established arts. So I picked 
amphitryon because I wanted to, it was always important to me that I use a medium for a reason. So in this case, we're looking at the world of the gods, at the power that gods have over people, at least the Greek gods as they were imagined, and I give this power to the media. So a monitor wall was scattered across the stage, and the humans were on the stage, exposed to the whim of the gods who chased them around with a background of film and computer graphics and compositing. Um, I thought that was an extremely gratifying event. Uh, it was exhausting because the media wasn't quite there. Everything took three times as long as we thought it should, but we did. And this is a collaboration with a dancer. Here I tried to get more painterly influence, uh, filters that sort of disembody bodies to integrate typography and base that on a stochastic principle. This is just a duet that we filmed and then I separated and multiplied and let the choreography fall in and out of harmony, in and out of chaos, thus the title. Um, I include only one single commercial work of maybe a hundred. That was design of the uh, film prize star to a Lola. What was important to me there also relating to our topic that I wanted to have a female statue and a statue that is a muse that uh, signifies motion, that doesn't signify the winner, but that signifies the inspiration and the art that leads to become a winner. Um, my engaged media series on art and ecology, I'm still working with that series because I'm, apart from my interest in the technology, it's really the message that it carries. And I'm extremely interested and extremely concerned about our environment. And I think as an artist, I can maybe open another avenue, another visual avenue in understanding or being aware of the dangers of climate change and I used a variety of venues for that. Um, and I used light drawings in the same context. I will go a little faster because I forgot. <laughs> um, this was an animation I made for the COP15 in Paris. Several artists around the world were making animations, so I, mount, I made an animation, mounted it on a bicycle, rode through, through the city and started conversations with people on climate change. Um, this is an, uh, um, an, a project on consumption. That's why it's called LESS. It is a mixture of a physical installation, an animation, an online interactive uh, part where um, you see one person cutting off. The idea was to dismantle the installation, take something from me and forego a purchase that otherwise maybe you would have made. Of course, I cannot control that, but I can just give an impetus to that kind of thinking. Um, this is a slightly different project in voluntary journeys when I spent a month on Lesbos and I, tra I interviewed f uh, refugees and I wanted to, the purpose was empathy with the single person and not seeing, let's say, millions or thousands. And I have painterly elements, text elements, textual elements, and I overlay them over Google Earth. And on Google Earth, you can actually download th this file and you can follow this interactively, or you can look at the images that I excerpted from Google Earth and also uh, work with in, um, in Photoshop back and forth. So I go in and out of different media, but the idea of light drawings, of typography, of painterly elements, uh, so sort of throughout my work. Similarly, okay, very quickly, this is an, a work on a botanical garden in India. You can look that up, it's on my website, also on Google Earth, and a work in progress right now, which reaches back into history, that is uh, about Jewish, ref Jewish refugees from Germany to Shanghai in the late 30s to mid 40s, where I'm trying to make something like an interactive history lesson with, you know, artistic elements as well. 
Um, this is the very last slide. This is my contribution to Herbert and an NFT as well as an, an artwork. I like to leave you with that. And thank you very much. If you need to know more, please look me up on my website. Super, thank you very much for those presentations. Well, um, notwithstanding the fact that Ada Lovelace in the 1800s was considered the first computer programmer and she was a woman, um, I think we need to start off really by considering the premise that technology is actually not neutral. It was invented by men, um, largely by men, and of course there were women involved um, throughout its history, but largely digital technology was created by and for men. And we are all familiar with the narrative that it came out of warfare. Uh, and indeed, logic is also based on the invention of men. Uh, additionally, what we might call the social construction of the computer has also been a male domain. And you've actually written about this, haven't you, Joan, in, um, in the past? I think there's a piece written in 1993, and you argue that a, a masculine approach is encoded into the technical personality of computing, as well as the skills and knowledge necessary to utilize computers. Yeah, it, it became very clear as I began to work with computers in the, with the mainframe and all of the peripheral aspects of that, that the process was very linear and hierarchical. And of course, I did not work that way. As an artist, I worked in a much more fluid, fluid intuitive way. So there was an ongoing <clears throat> sort of overturning, I guess you could say, of the way computers normally worked to formulate them so that it was in a framework that I was comfortable. I mean, the vocabulary, all of those kinds of things um, really were ma f formatted in the mail uh, in, or highly gendered, I would say. Yes, yeah, and Sherry Tuckle, for those of you who are interested, is someone, um, Sherry Turkle is someone else who has written about the computer has no inherent gender bias, she says, but the computer culture is not equally neutral. What was your experience in the early days, Maxfield? Um, my experience was that I was sort of a curiosity. It wasn't so much the aesthetics, although I do think my aesthetics are influenced by painting and more of a painterly light, uh, light in terms of not heavy, but in terms of lights and light drawing approach. But I felt that the work environment very much tried to relegate women into a sort of subordinate role. I had to really make clear that I'm not the secretary. It's called selective ignorance. I don't type, at least except for make my own. <laughs> make coffee. <laughs> I am happy to make coffee if you make coffee for me. But um, so I think it, it was very important to sort of set some boundaries and, but I would say when, when I was younger and uh, the biggest difference was when I became a mother, there all of a sudden I found myself in a, uh, in a much more difficult role. Just to put it in one sentence, over time, staying longer, working 18 hours, working 20 hours, the engineer called home and said, honey, I'm late, and I said, Honey, I don't have a wife at home. So that was my problem. <laughs> yes, yes. And I think you've also said, Till, that it would have been different. You would have had a different career if you hadn't have had children. Yes, but I'm very happy to have my children. They're a very creative project. <laughs> but, I, but I guess the point, the, po the point is, I guess, yeah. that, that men don't have to think about such things like that. The, that, is, that is very true. So you have to choose then, you know, do you find someone to watch your kids or is it responsible? You cannot have childcare 16 hours a day, then why are you a parent or a mother? And um, so I would say for me, the biggest difference as a woman was in the social work situation, not that much in the aesthetic, okay. you know. Joan, how, about, how was your experience as being a mother in the early days? Well, I took my four-year-old with me to the computer center while we put the, she, you know, she was happy camper, while we put the cards in the card reader and then went off to get ice cream while we waited for the printout. So um, I think it was, in a sense, a very positive experience. The one aspect of, of being a female in this uh, realm of technical 
um, stuff was that we could work under the radar. And I felt that I did have a lot of freedom and a lot of flexibility to create the kinds of things that I was uh, interested in creating. So that was very positive. And, and why do you think that was? Is it because that computer art and media art was so wacky and out there anyway that, that you weren't really so much part of the art world so you, and the fact that you were a woman, well, that's just another thing and you might as well just, you can f sail under the radar. Yeah, I think <clears throat> the art people weren't threatened at that point because they didn't feel that it was going to be serious. anything no. uh, serious and wasn't going to compete with them. I, I will relay one interesting experience. When I did go to the Art Institute as a professor, I, w I was in the elevator with a painter because art and technology department was in the basement, as you can imagine, and painting was on the fourth floor. And so I'm in the elevator with a friend of mine who's a painter, and he says to me, you know, Joan, you're never going to be able to make art with a computer. <laughs> But I'm sure probably Charles Surrey and other people were probably told that as well. In fact, we saw an earlier um, document yeah. saying that too. Um, so what do we think has changed for women since we began, this field began? Um, has, what, what do you see that, have, or, that has changed for the better? Um, I, I do think that women have taken a very active and leading role in digital arts. And I would say that was also one of the advantages. It was really in computer animation, computer graphics was sort of an uncharted territory in terms of where kind of where role models were being distributed, male or female. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was a place where you could take a role and it wasn't that you are displacing somebody else or that you are questioning an existing oh, hierarchy it, to that so cinema. New. Because it was new right. and roles were being re redistributed right. and I do think we could take one. If you look at the landscape today, of course there's still very male dominated parts of computer animation, but if you look at computer graphics, media, video, I think the distribution is fairly, uh, fairly even. Even, yeah. And, and what about um, being a mother today? Is it still quite difficult? You were telling me earlier about in the U.S. that's just, just not set up for childcare. Well, the U.S. doesn't have an, an enviable social system for, for nobody. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but I was, I was able to, to change my role and change my work so that it fitted both my professional and, and familiar desires. So being freelance, being independent, starting your own company. Yes. And I think today there are a lot more models in terms of working from home, working part-time. And I think that frees up men as well as women if they want to spend more time with their family. You know? So some good things have changed. How, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> How have you seen things change, Joan? Well, I, um, I think they have definitely changed. Women have been very... Uh, inventive in the artwork that they've created. And, and I think early on, when it was a group of women who initiated exhibitions so that provided opportunities for digital artists, like in the SIGGRAPH art show. Mm -hmm. So, um, and today I, I think that women, and, and as models for our children, uh, young men and young women, um, that we play a leadership role because we have formed the field and formed the tool to make what we want to make. We're not just making drawings because that's what the computer does. We're deciding what it is that we want to create. And in my case, I've done a lot of work with textiles and also 3D printing. So I believe that women have, in, in because of our ability and our freedoms that we have, that we've been able to innovate uh, and create unique kinds of artwork. And actually respond to some of the challenges that, um, that technology threw up so that you could help shape some of that technology yourself. Yes, I think I, for some reason I've had the ability to ignore the difficulties by just persisting yes. and continuing, like, like with the loom that I currently have, it's both a combination of analog and digital programming. And so early on when I ran into a technical problem with the loom itself, the frustration was almost unbearable. And then and, and it occurred to me, this is problem solving. <laughs> and once I got into that mode of thinking, then I could solve problems with, with the loom. Yeah. So you, you feel that women approach technology different from, differently from how men do? Oh, yes, definitely. I, I go right along with Sherry Turkle. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a depth and a breadth to the way that women are able to embrace technology, I think. And because we don't have 
certain specific kinds of expectations. And that's allowed us yeah. to take control of, of the creative process and in, embed the technology in the studio creative process in individualized ways, in unique ways that yeah. go along with the kinds of artwork that we envision. And what about you, Mattel? What How do you see the um, em embedding of, um, of a, a unique, perhaps feminine psyche through, through technology? Are, is, are you able to use the technology in a way that is, is perhaps in a, in a, from a different standpoint, do you think? Yeah. Um, I am not so sure if it's the technology itself, but the themes that I choose. Yeah. It is very important to me that I do work that carries a meaning, and I think the way I choose meaning uh, may have a feminine aspect, but I hope I'm not alone with it, and men will join me in that when I think of ecological awareness, because it takes all of us, not just half of us. Yes. And um, so, but I like to, to work with, I like to work with technology, but I want to carry a certain meaning. The technology does not necessarily come first. It did maybe in the beginning, in the early fascination, but I think, what I'm saying with it is the most important, and that may or may not be a female aspect. Yeah, interesting, interesting. So um, we've got a few more minutes left, so I think I'll just finish by asking one final um, question, Joan, about you. Were, well, you both have been involved in academia, so let me ask you what, um, what some of your experiences in academia in the 70s and 80s was. Well, all of you that have worked in academia know this, um, this show here, but I think early on when I went to the, Art, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago as chair, I was able to form curriculum uh, based on ideas and also hire people. I created a class called um, Electronic Ritual and Ceremony because I think the way we use computers parallels ritual and ceremony in indigenous cultures. But as time went on and I was no longer chair, it was more difficult to create curriculum based on those kinds of concepts. And the, the philosophy of the department then came, became that one should teach the technology first and then make the artwork second. But from my perspective, if you do that, the technology then informs the work. I prefer, in my perspective, is to focus on art making first and what it is you want to communicate to your audience and then figure out or learn about the technology that allows you to enhance that creative process. But you found that to be a fundamentally different approach from that which was in the male-dominated academic realm. Yeah, because my approach was much more about ideas and concepts that we could y use the computer to express in a variety of different forms, whether it's sound, image, animation, or whatever. Um, but my colleagues decided that they were much more interested in teaching process, you know, teaching technology. And it, for me, that became frustrating. That's very interesting. How was your experience, Amectil? Was, that, was it similar in that in the, a, a male-dominated academic environment when you first... It entered? was a little different because I entered academia later. I okay. spent about... 10 to 15 years working commercially in various studios where I thought that the male-female difference was more pronounced. Right. In academia it was a little less, but what I found is that I really wanted to bridge uh, academia and the process because my students are mainly uh, video interactive designer, they rarely are fine artists. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be sure that academia, academia actually reflected what was going on in part of the industry and get industry speakers come to the school, get students to go into there and have sort of a cross-fertilization between these areas and not have this uh, segregation between design and academia and students sort of stumbling into the work world, not, not really knowing what to expect there. Yeah. So it had a different aspect. The, um, 
like I said, the, the, the female aspect was much more related to the work environment and those things. I have a nice little anecdote on an, on an early academic experience. I, my babysitter canceled on me on graduation day, so we had to go in gowns and everything, so I had no choice but to put my baby in a snuggly and have his head stick out of the gown. And I was, uh, but people liked it. <laughs> you, find, you found a way, you found a way to, to, to yeah. move through something that... You, you improvise know, and improvise. have a laugh, and, yes, you know. Yes, yes, <laughs> and, and, and have come a long way and very strong. I think we need to, you know, to kind of finish on a note to say that um, uh, because of our, per our persistence, it's paid off and made re really a very significant contribution. Women have made a huge and significant contribution to this field, and it's not actually that well known So from the early pioneers. So I think it's really great that we've got um, particularly you, Joan, here today, and also you, Mechtel. So thank you so very much. Do we, have, do we have one minute? We have one what, minute. What, one what your point. role in oh. all that? I know you're the moderator, but give us a little, well, little I, summary. I, I'm only in my middle 50s, so <laughs> I'm, maybe I'm... A, but, but uh, you know, when I started out in 2002, looking into the history of computer art, nobody had any interest in this whatsoever. So I think it's nice that we now have a lot more female curators. We've got more women in museums, at higher positions in museums, and this means that, um, you know, computer art as a, as a body of work um, is getting more recognition, and some of the artists are getting more recognition. We saw Vera Molnar earlier on today, which is nice, and there are other names as well, which hopefully, as the years go by, will come out, and we can celebrate their work as well. Sorry, I put you on the spot. No, that's all right. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much.